It's a little while um, since I did the last one of these. I did three messages in a row on what I called Satan side trackers. And what I mean by that is simply things that can take us away from the heart of God. And one of the greatest ways I think that Satan does this is he, he diverts our worship. And I don't mean that he does this in the most obvious ways because we wouldn't fall for that. You know, it's pretty obvious if someone comes up to you and says, what's two plus two? And you say six. Uh, you would hope that there's an element of someone who might detect pretty straightforward or pretty quickly that that is not correct. You would hope. Potentially these days, you might say, well, it might be true for you. No, but <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. You know what I'm getting at. You should pick that up. It's the more subtle things. And I actually spoke last time about the one degree. You can be out by just one degree and it doesn't actually seem much, but if you go further and further at one degree, one degree suddenly actually really matters. And that's what I want to look at today. So I want to look at what I would call the heart of worship and where, as disciples, we go with this. Um, this is certainly not extensive by any means. You could do a whole Bible course on this at university, but... First thing I want to talk about when we come to worship, and I see this, I see this here, I see this across the whole Christian world. We, we often talk, oh, we're coming, you know, we're about to do worship. Do worship. It's an interesting thing. Uh, what is do worship? I often thought that. What is doing worship? Because worship actually is a positioning of our heart. It's a position of our heart. I just want to read from Matthew 4, 8 to 11. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. But then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him you will or you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold angels came and ministered to him. This is a posturing of the heart. Jesus' response showed this. It's a bowing down before the Lord as we serve him and honour him as we worship him. It's him and him alone. There's no compromise here with Jesus. There's no compromise. It would have been easy to say, look, let's make it 93% and the other seven I'll get two loaves of bread, a bit of water and just make it much easier in the desert. No, it's a positioning of the heart. It's all about God. So what does Christian worship look like? Again, from the scripture. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. First of all, note here that Jesus is really clear on this. He said, true worshippers will worship in spirit and truth. So what do we mean by truth? That means it must be accurate to the scripture. All right. The scripture, in a sense, it gives us a measure. We need that. We need that. But then it's also in the spirit. And that's the part that also hits the heart. And I know I'm making a, a, a division here which doesn't really exist because the two mix. But the truth, it must be sound. It must be true. No one degree off. 
but then it also comes from the heart and that's where the spirit works through us John Wimber, I always remember, had a saying. I'm just going to read so I make sure I get it right. And he said, if you have the word, but you don't have the spirit, you dry up. You'll dry up. If you have the spirit, but you don't have the word to guide you, you'll blow up. But if you have the word and the spirit, you will grow up. So, how do we do this? How do we, how do we do this? How do we worship in spirit and truth? What does this look like? I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting here for a bit because worship involves sacrifice, but of a particular type, as you'll see later. But our sacrifice can never achieve the removal of our sin. Forgiveness and salvation are a gift of God's grace. This is from Hebrews 10:12. Christ, our high priest, has made one sacrifice for sin for all time. No matter what we do, we cannot erase our sin. So no sacrifice is going to do that. No fasting every second day for the next 30 years is going to do it. Only Jesus can remove our sin. Only Jesus can do it. But we have to actually accept that. His sacrifice was enough. And we need to be aware of that. Because some Christians get diverted at this very point. They understand that God's forgiven them but they themselves hold themselves to a higher level. Oh, and God might have forgiven me, but oh, I'm, still, I'm still a terrible sinner. Yes, you were, but you've been cleansed. All right, your identity is, you're a son and daughter of God. You're meant to rejoice in the fact you're forgiven. If Jesus is enough, and that's what God says, what right do we have to say, contradict God? It's like Mike said before, with the, you know, the death of the firstborn. Who are we to question? If God says it's enough, it's enough. Accept it. Accept that you are actually loved in him. You are forgiven as a Christian. We need to remember that we're actually reconciled to Christ. And this is what I'm getting at. I want to read this from Romans 5. It's 8, 9 and then 11. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you see how much he loves you? He died for you, even then. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, he's done it. It's not our sacrifice, it's his. His free gift of grace. But not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. See, God loves you and he accepts you. You're in Christ. It's been done. He loves you as a son and daughter. Yes, I know there are times when we can stuff up. I get that. But he loves you. A parent still loves their child. And godly parents still love their child when they still make mistakes. It doesn't mean you might approve of the mistake, but you still love the child. We need to rest in that knowledge that our Heavenly Father, our Abba, really loves us. It's not just words on a page. The Bible is a living word. It speaks to us needs to speak into us, that we are loved. Ephesians 1.5, it tells us more than that, it tells us we're adopted as his children. So when we come to worship, 
We're coming from this position. We're not outsiders. We're beloved kids of our God, our Father. That's a really intimate place to be. The closest to family when we come into worship. Don't believe Satan's lies because you are righteous before God now. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I'm reading it. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, Jesus died in our place. He did it for us. That makes us righteous. Why? Because he was righteous. He was righteous. He died for us so that we could be righteous and be in that union with God, with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You might say sometimes, yes, but what about my condition? You know, I struggle with this. I'm still struggling with this thing or whatever it is. Yes, that might be true. And you might need to, and you would in that situation, need to go to God. Maybe go to godly uh, people who can mentor you and help you. There might be things there that you need to break off in the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus. But your condition is not your position. Remember that. Your position is a child of the Most High God, your Abba Father, who loves you. I think Mike just said it so beautifully today, communion. 1,400 years back, this story was already unfolding. And that was before Jesus. It's a love story. It is a love story, but one that showed love in the greatest way because it involved such pain and sacrifice on behalf of Jesus. But he did it. That's why John 3.16, God so loved the world, you can see it. You can see it here. So trust the indwelling of the Spirit. And this is another thing. Because you are righteous, that's your position. Then trust the Holy Spirit to work on your condition. Because we are works in progress as Christians. That's what we used to call sanctification. It's when the Holy Spirit works in us. In layman's terms, it takes the rough edges off. We become more like Christ as we go in discipleship. This is all part of worship. Because when we engage in that, we are saying, Lord, you are the answer. Lord, we love you and we trust you because we actually don't know necessarily what this is going to look like. And there might be actually pain in our offering, in our positioning to do this. But we trust you because we love you. That's worship. That's part of our worship as Christians. Here's sanctification 101, if you like. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. And how does He do this? Because He draws us back to repentance. Yes, we're already saved. That's our position. We're saved. But the condition, there will be times when we fall short and we sin and we repent. The Spirit will convict us. It does worry me at times. I hear it and it's more so in the Pentecostal circles at times. I hear this at times where they go, well, now I'm a Christian, I can't sin. You must be a better one than me. Good luck. Um, now, I, I get it that as you go, you should sin less. Of course, of course. Of course, that's the case. But there will be times as we grow in the Spirit, the Scripture says it, will make us more and more like Him. 
The fact that he's making us more like him suggests that it hasn't already happened. We are works in progress. And that work should have, of course, become more and more like Christ as we go. But it is a work in progress. And repentance is so important because what does repentance do? Repentance means that you're listening to the Spirit. It means you can hear the conviction. It means you're walking closer with God. It's that sensitivity to the Spirit that allows us to worship in spirit and truth. So just what does this look like as we then walk it out? Because worship should be 24-7. It's how we walk. He is always worthy of kingship, so worship should be happening all the time. So what's it look like? So just a simple, many of you will know this from Micah chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Obviously, this is not extensive, but to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Is that not us as apprentices modelling the Master, Jesus? Did he not act justly? Did he not model mercy? Think of the woman caught in adultery. Is that not mercy? Jesus modelled this stuff. Walk humbly with your God. But remember, not your will, Abba, or not my will, but your will be done. Is that not walking humbly with your God to go, Father, I trust you, I'll go to a cross? That is amazing humility. For someone who did not sin. This is what we call loving out the commandment that Jesus taught us. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as yourself. So what's that love look like as we worship? 1 Corinthians 13, many of you would have heard it. 4 to 8a. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is what godly love, true love, looks like. Note, truth is embedded in it. You cannot have love without truth. It's really important to note that. And note there also, it says, love does not delight in evil. Again, There's no evil in godly love. See, love is a fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Love comes from God. This is a godly love. This is the true love because we get told a whole lot of rubbish. And I'm putting it nicely because you know, this has always got to be PG. I could say it a lot worse on some of the definitions I hear of love around today. You know, love is love. Try using that on a university sheet or exam when you've got to define a term. Just repeat it. I, mean, it I know it works for cockatoos. They're very good. They can, you say, hello, cocky. They say, hello, cocky. And that works really well and you commend them. But it's not necessarily the greatest definition. The Bible tells us what love is. 
and we see it. It's written and we see it lived out in Jesus. Worship, Christian worship, actually sees us walk out our faith, that command to love God and love our neighbour as ourselves, but you will do it in the power of the Spirit and love will be that test. You'll see it, but it's a godly love. It's not defined by the world. It's defined by God. And so we are to be living sacrifices. And this is, the, this is the key here, because I know I said we can't get salvation by our sacrifice, and that's true, we can't, absolutely. It's a gift of God, it's grace. But when we come to worship, there is actually sacrifice. Because we, we're not talking about our salvation, we're talking now about worshipping God. Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God... This is what he wants. Are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. When we come to worship, our sacrifice is our free will offering of everything we are, we give to him. It's that simple. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's no compromise. And it's only when we actually grasp the depth of the love and sacrifice that Jesus made for us, the love of God for us, it will compel us into this position of a broken spirit when we realise that. That contrite heart. But then, of course, in the joy of our salvation, it becomes an amazing, an amazing awareness of joy that we have in our relationship with him. Romans 12.1 Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... Interesting, the mercy bit comes up again, which we saw in Micah. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is a call to offer who we are in Christ to him. No restrictions. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we offer everything we are, everything we can be, as those redeemed and adopted sons and daughters, we offer it to him. And in doing so, there will be just one intent, and that will be to worship him and be in his, in his presence. To be in the Lord's presence in the joy of that intimate family love. Anything we do outside of that, any action, whatever else, has to come as an expression of that. So yes, we are not just meant to sit on our blessed assurance. The Lord actually calls us to be disciples. He did say go. It's very difficult to go if you don't move. All right, that's part of it. There is that part. So there are works, if you like, but it's nothing to do with salvation. It's just being disciples, in that sense, once we're saved. Salvation's by grace. The story of Mary and Martha, I just want to highlight this. Because I think we can get caught up and this is my suspicion that's happened, certainly in the last 30 years or so, I think we can get caught in a works mentality. I think we've seen it in the secular world a lot. We have seen uh, KPIs become so important, individual contracts, 
we've become much more individualistic. I remember even as a teenager, I think it was one of the banks had an ad for the most important person in the world, you. I think that probably summed it up pretty well of what that sort of ethos is. And I look at the story of Mary and Martha, you might remember it, Jesus has come to visit. And you'll notice that Mary's sacrifice there was a heart that only desired Jesus' presence. Remember, she was just at Jesus' feet. She stayed there. She just wanted his presence. Now, Martha did good works for Jesus. There's no question, you know, she's trying to prepare food. They were good works. But the problem was... While the work seemed good, she'd actually positioned herself outside of that deeper presence. She was on the periphery. She would be what I think my wife would say, call fluffing around, doing stuff. But it, she wasn't in the deeper place. Mary knew the deeper place. She was at the feet of Jesus. My suspicion is Mary had no idea that there were jobs to be done. She was just focused on Jesus. Totally. Martha had a different agenda. Martha was trying to make sure that everything went well. That was her ambition. That was her role. She was making sure everything went well. But the problem was that's not what Jesus actually asked of her. That was her stepping into the role of God. She was deciding what was right and wrong. Actually, no. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you. She'd made the secondary stuff the focus. Mary had it, her focus very much on the primary. It was all about Jesus. And, and I guess the question I'm thinking of, and this is what I look back in the last 30 years, and I think as Christians and much of the church, have we not become like Martha? Because that's what I see in a lot of it. And I'm not just talking about here, I'm talking about the whole church. I think we've become much more like Martha in the last 30 years. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, this guy has a vineyard background, sole survivor church in the UK, Mike uh, Pilavachi. And some of you will know this story, but I'm going to read it. He's a pastor, had this church, it was going well, a lot of young people church, it was really thriving. On every external measure, you would go, this church was on fire for God. Everything was going well. And this is what, this is his words, I'm just reading them. Over the years, people had poured out their hearts to God through this place. And there have been plenty of examples of great things happening as a result. Therefore, in the autumn of 1996, we realised that something was up with our worship. Keep my, remembering here, I'm not talking about music alone, I'm talking about the whole thing of worship. At first, it was difficult to put our finger on the problem. On the surface, everything was just fine with our musicians and sound engineers. Each service contained a block of songs that focused on the cross and gave people a chance to get down to business with God but we seem to lose something over the years. We seem to have gone through the motions and I noticed that although we were singing songs, our hearts were actually far from him. Was it Matt Redmond's fault? Most of you will probably know Matt Redmond's a very well-known um, worship leader, music worship leader. I listened, he actually wasn't singing any more duff notes than he usually did. Then it clicked. We had actually become connoisseurs of worship instead of participants. In our hearts, we were giving the worship marks out of ten. Not that song again. Oh, I can't hear the bass. Oh, I don't like the way she sings. We'd made the band the performers of worship and ourselves were the audience. We'd forgotten that we are 
all worshippers and that God is the audience. We had forgotten that sacrifice of the heart is central to biblical worship. We were challenged to ask ourselves individually, when I come through the door of a church, what am I bringing as my contribution to worship? And the truth came to us. Worship is not a spectator sport. It is not a product moulded by the taste of the consumer. It is not about what we get out of it. Not at all. It is all about God. We needed to take drastic action. So for a while, in order to truly learn what this lesson meant, we banned the band and sacked Matt Redman. And then we sat around in a circle and said if no one brought a sacrifice of praise, we would just spend the meeting in silence. At the beginning, we virtually did. It was very painful. We were learning again not to just rely on music. After a while, we began to have some very sweet times of worship. We all began to bring our prayers, our scripture readings, our prophecies, our thanksgivings, our praises and our songs. Excitement came back. We were no longer having church. We were once again meeting with the Lord. With all the comforts stripped away, we were now worshipping from the heart. By the way, I think this place is in a good place. I'm not... It's not but it, this is across Christendom. This could be a rabbit hole. I'm going down, Mike. So prepare. I was talking to someone just recently, actually, in this congregation who said, contemporary Christian music has done so much damage. And I thought, wow. Why? And it got me thinking... And they said, because there was a period of time, and I'm thinking of the, the vineyard days, the early days. And it wasn't just the vineyard, it was in the Pentecostal churches too. Most of us here would know the vineyard traditions, but they were both going. And the spirit was working through, and it was raw. There was a rawness to it. And he was saying, what's happened is we then started to go like Martha. We need... Oh, we need to present something that's as good as the seculars do. You know, we need to be as good as the secular music. And so we became quite professional. Again, nothing wrong with skill and that. That's a good thing. But it's the heart. The heart has to be the pursuit of the presence of God and nothing else. Nothing else. And then we started to see music produced we started to see bands come out who have nothing to do with churches. One of the things I admire, and I absolutely admire, this will get rid of 50% of the congregation, um, Bill Johnson on, so good on this point. He says with their music teams, they can only be away from church for one Sunday. Because he said, if you are a ministry, you can, like Coles, you cannot be away from the fire for long. But what we've seen is we've seen a whole production of of bands and things who aren't accountable to any church. They just get there, they produce their music, and the music might be wonderful, don't get me wrong. In the same way Martha was doing good things, she wasn't preparing bad food, I'm sure. It's not that. But who are they accountable to? And then we're so content. We see worship, and I'm talking about music, we see worship leaders up the front with in-ears, now, some of you won't know what an in-ear is. It means that you can hear someone talking, so there's a music director guiding it. My question is, how can you hear the Holy Spirit when you've got someone else in your ear yapping away, saying, now we come in, two, three, four. You cannot hear the Holy Spirit. We are not performers for connoisseurs. That's the point. We do not have that in this church, praise God. I know that's always been the case. We have not had that, and we won't. 
That's nothing against communication. You know, people at the back and that communicating, that's fine, that's different. But the actual people who are leading it, they need to lead us and we can only follow where they go. That's how leadership works. And we've seen this. And it looks good, some of the stuff. But some of it, you just look at it and you go, because I love, I've got my Spotify, don't get me wrong, I've got that, but I look at some of it and I go, this is actually useful because I can actually worship God through it. But it, is, it has actually become, we're producing something for connoisseurs. Because you can see it. The, the whole team will all have their in ears. There's a music director there and they will have brought some recruits because they're going to film it in a barn or something so it looks really good. And I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. But we need to be 100% sold out to the heart and presence of God. It's got to be all about him. All about him. And that's what that church found. And what we will find, guys, as we do this, we will start to see the priesthood of all believers starting to rise because we worship as one. That's what that church in the UK found. That's what used to happen in the early days of the vineyard. That's what happened in all the great moments of the Pentecostal movements. We've seen it. People worship as one. The priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter 2, 5 to 9 there. But you are a chosen people. Remember what Mike said this morning. You're a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. That's why we worship. We worship the one who saved us and redeemed us why that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light and when we get that as a church we are going to see the movement of the spirit as we saw in a lot of those times the 80s and the 90s it's a travesty that so many of our young ones have not seen that and that's an indictment on us if that's the case I have seen people on a medical bed. I've seen my own father, a stroke victim, lying on a bed, unable to walk, unable to talk. And we're talking many, many hours after this happened. And this was back 30 years ago, so it's not when, or 40 years ago now. It's not when uh, we had better medicines. This was back. And the doctors had already been in there and told him he'll probably never talk again. It's going to take years. So we're at that stage. And I remember praying and I don't actually fully understand it because I didn't even think about the context of the prayer. I was just talking to God and said he needs to be healed. And I remember, I remember that moment when he literally just gave me a hug after the prayer and said, thanks, mate. And we both realised he had full movement and full voice. We want more of that. And it's not because we want what the Lord does. It's because when that happens... We know his presence is here. That's what I want to see. That's where we're going. We are not just having church. This is personal. Us as God's family, together, all in it together. So we come with humility. How can you not be humble when you know that you were lost and someone, when you couldn't do anything, someone loved you enough to go to a cross and die for you? How can not that just not make you overcome with emotion of love? Because that's what he did. And each time we stuff up since then, He still forgives us when we repent. He loves us. Because it's when we humble ourselves in repentance. It's when we seek his face and nothing else but him. It's when we offer our being for him and for him alone. Then we will worship in spirit and truth. And then we will see more of his kingdom breaking in. I'm just going to read this. Dye's not here today. This is Dye Johnson. 
We've been talking here. We are seeing more and more miracles happening. We've been having those testimonies. I think we had Julius. Julius last week or the week. Julius was last week. Mike's nodding. We're having these stories. I'm just going to read this one. Di knows about it. She's given me permission, so it's all fine. Um, About two nights after returning home from my sister's death by breast cancer, my sleep was broken by a nightmare. I was visited by something setting me up to be murdered. I did not go back to sleep that night knowing where it came from and who was involved. I am well aware, as John 10.10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Prior to leaving Adelaide, I was due for a breast screening and I rang to postpone the event. I was informed that they could squeeze me in within a couple of days. I gave in to their encouragement, you know, get over it and get it done. When I arrived home, I had a message waiting for me saying that there were um, abnormalities with the scan and come in for further investigations immediately. So I fronted up on May 15. Having been there and done that, Dyer's had breast cancer many years ago. I knew that when three remained in the waiting room, it didn't bode well. I knew there were three because I can still count. After four hours of further investigation, my daughter Louise collected me and carried me home. Then we came to wait for results. On looking at it from a different angle, then came the time when I could gather under God's wings. There was comfort knowing that others had me in their prayers. And that was our prayer team, guys. That, uh, there's a prayer team, people don't know, that we have. That if you ever need prayer, you just send in the email, it's confidential. And we have people who intercede, pray and fast on your behalf. Each night I would read through the Psalms and talk to God. And each day I was fascinated by and dived into the topic of the Shekinah glory. I also realised that my laptop seemed to be scrolling through my favourite songs and hymns all by itself. On Thursday, Louise and I downed a Portuguese tart and then we went to receive the results. I think I was prepared to accept direction, whatever direction my life was to go, but I knew God was a loving God. The doctor showed us the scans and we saw the lump very clearly surrounded by calcium markers. And then he said, the news is good. There's no cancer, no need for any investigation. Just go home. I cried most of the way home and we celebrated with a special tea. I woke Friday morning feeling as if I'd been given a new lease on life. I didn't expect to have those feelings. I also realised that the nightmare or visit that was designed to cause me to be fearful, for that is what Satan does. If I had not known that it was Satan, I believe my journey could well have been different. I am living with a great awareness of the goodness of God, the healing mercy of God, and the greatness of God. I am so grateful. I just want to finish. That's dies. We are seeing this more and more. Because I think if we just press in to God, just trust, just press in as his kids, he loves us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He says that. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We don't always understand his ways. I get that. I'm not saying that every single person gets healed. Even Lazarus died twice. But what I do know is the more we press in, the more we seek him and his heart, the more we walk in that spirit and truth in worship of him, we see more and more of his presence. And where his presence is, we will see him manifest. See, and I'm just finishing here, pure worship also is part of the Lord's plan for including his children in ruling with him through his authority and power. 
Remember, he gave us authority and power. And it does more than that. It does so much more, even though that that itself is just mind-blowing. But it does more than that. See, pure worship, it draws us into intimacy with God. It protects us with humility. It transforms with holiness. It anoints with power. It unifies in community. It releases revelation and increases our inheritance while it trains us to rule with his wisdom. That revelation, yes, it can come through prophetic words and all of that, but it will always, always reflect the Bible. That's always the measure. It'll always be true to the scripture. The minute you get a prophetic word or anything that's not true to the scripture, just can it. It is not of God. Simple. That's always the test. I think I've said to you before, I've heard people say some of the most wackiest things and you think, how could you say that's of God? And yet, they don't test it with, test the spirit. Use the scripture. Test it. This is where we're going, guys. And this is why pure worship is so important. It is 24-7. Paul talks about pray without ceasing. It's the same with worship. You think that's impossible. How do you pray all the time? How do you well, it's actually it's a positioning of your heart. When your heart's positioned with God, you will worship because he's worthy of kingship 24-7. You'll pray because that's, prayer is communion with God. That's what it means. As we do this and press in more and more, we are so blessed in this church. We really are so blessed. We are a church that are pressing in more and more and we love it and we love what he's doing. But above all, you know what? As much as I love to see what I do, the reason I really love it is actually because I know he loves it and it's all about him. It's about him.